I think so. Okay, great. Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Welcome to the Tri-State Master Networks uh, panel discussion that we're having today. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to those listening um, after this discussion. Um, what we're going to do today is we're having our panelists are going to be um, speaking. We're going to show a little video. And at the end, we're going to um, field questions. So please do this. If you have a question, put it in the chat. And we'll, we'll monitor those and we'll get to those at the end. So appreciate that. So welcome today to our panel discussion on courageous conversations and introduction to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, my name is Tina Campbell. I'm the New York and Connecticut tri -state, or Tri-State Regional Partner of Master Networks. Um, and today we've uh, got together a panelist, three panelists that are are well versed in the subject, and I want to say something up front. I'm not, so you know, honestly, this is as much of an education for me as it is for many of you. And I think it's time and timely to do this right now, while we're going to be able to um, feel, um, you know, like we're not going to come out of here like this is going to be the the only conversation you're going to hear. This will be. We're hoping for a series. We're hoping to really create this conversation with everyone. But we want to ask that that you all in this meeting really attend with an open mind and with empathy, please. We want to create, as we do at Master Networks all the time, a safe space. We talk about that a lot. And this is really important. We want people to be able to ask questions openly, um, for the purpose of learning, that's why we're all here, and really without judgment. And we ask everyone to be mindful of the language that's being used, you know, even in your feedback and your questions, just be mindful, because we really want to respect one another. And I know that we do that in Master Networks, but especially today as we're coming together for this important discussion. So I'd really like the panelists to take one uh, chance, one by one, to so tell a little bit about themselves. Can we start with Yvette? Sure, no problem. Thank you, Tina. Um, I just wanna start off by, by thanking everyone for, for joining us here, for, for coming with your curiosity and your openness. That's really important. So my name is Yvette Sanchez. My pronouns are she and her. Um, my husband, Jose and I are the owners of your CBD store in Wappingers. And we are members of the Wappingers chapter for Master Networks. We joined Master Networks at the same time that our store opened last September. Jose is in the store most of the days, and I still currently hold my corporate job at the London Stock Exchange. So I've worked in the corporate sector for 25 years. Um, I have about 15 years experience in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. I graduated from Pace University in White Plains in Westchester um, with a bachelor's degree in business administration, a minor in psychology, I love psychology, and an area of concentration in human resources. So I love people. Um, and I think that's why this, this topic for me is really, it hits home. I live in Fishkill with Jose and our two amazing teenage daughters. I'm a city girl, I came from Queens and we moved up here about 13 years ago and who would have known I, I'm a country girl too. So um, I will pass the mic over to JJ. Thank you, Yvette. I'm JJ, I go by they, them pronouns. I am the um, owner and a licensed mental, counsel mental health counselor of Rainbow Counseling and Consultation LLC. So I'm a therapist that serves LGBTQ individuals, adults, and families. Um, I have other therapists at my practice as well that work more with adolescents. We've worked with a lot of transgender people, particularly at my practice. I got started in DEI a few years ago when I was working in substance use recovery at an outpatient clinic. And we had a training on LGBTQ competency and during that training, I came out, the CEO of the company was there and they're like, do you want to train the staff of the entire company? And I was like, sure. Um, so I got involved that way into DEI. Um, 
since then, I've really had a passion for it, been doing lots of reading on it, been involved in a bunch of different things. Um, and I've also gotten involved in doing DEI trainings for legal cannabis industries in Massachusetts. So that's what brings me here today. Um, I live in Ridgefield, Connecticut with Zach Chavez, who is also on the meeting. Um, and I'm happy to meet you all. I'll pass it on to Greg. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Greg Knowles. My pronouns are he, him, his. I work for an agency uh, called Access Supports for Living. We are in about 15 counties in New York. It's an organization that provides an array of services for people with disabilities and behavioral health issues. I am the assistant director of employer services and workforce partnerships. My role involves uh, helping individuals overcome barriers to employment. Um, Prior to joining Access, I was uh, a vice president and head of university relations and recruiting at J.P. Morgan Chase. Spent a number of years there in various HR roles. Um, my wife and I live in Orange County, New York. We are empty nesters. Go empty nesters. Um, we have two daughters who are doing very well. I am uh, a proud dad. Uh, one lives in Manhattan and the other lives in Brooklyn. Um, and later on, I'll tell you about my foray, if you will, uh, into uh, DEI. Well, thank you. So as you can see, I think we really uh, brought together um, three of, of um, the best panelists we could for this introduction. So let me share my screen right now. We just have a quick um, definition of what DEI stands for. Would one of the panelists like to, to take this or do? Yeah, I could, I could take it, Tina. Great. Um, so we, we just thought we would put up the definition in, you know, just to level the playing field. So diversity is the presence of the difference given um, within a given setting. So Diversity is really the what, it's the representation of difference. So be it gender, race, faith, color, age, sexual orientation, um, even ability. So it's those underrepresented communities that we wanna bring in. Um, equity is ensuring that processes and programs are impartial, they're fair, and they provide equal possible outcomes for every individual. So the equity, we think of it as the why. Um, to level the field, to ensure that everyone can compete fairly and has the same opportunities. Inclusion is, um, it's the how. So it's the, the definition is the practice of ensuring that people feel of belonging, right? So that means ensuring that people have a voice, that they feel heard, and then they ultimately feel that they are uh, you know a belonging and an active participant in within a setting. Okay, great. So let's um, we're going to get now to stop sharing and we'll get to a few questions for the panelists. Again, as you have questions on this, please put it in the chat. Thank you. Um, so, can each of you tell us about what was your involvement from uh, with DEI from a business and even a per personal perspective? Who wants to go first? I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Okay. So um, my involvement with uh, diversity dates back to my time with J.P. Morgan Chase uh, when I was uh, in university relations and recruiting. Um, and notice I said diversity and I didn't include uh, equity and inclusion. Uh, a big focus for us was an increasing uh, the uh, hiring, our hiring of people, uh, people of color and, and um, women. Uh, but we struggled to do this. Looking back at it, we had a hard time doing this. Uh, one, one, it was difficult attracting people of color and, and uh, women. Uh, and when we did hire them, they, we weren't able to keep them. 
Um, and what this tells us is that uh, it's just not only about diversity, it's about impartiality, fairness, in other words, equity. Um, it's also about making everyone feel welcomed in the organization, that's inclusion. Um, so that was JP Morgan Chase uh, at, at, at Access, at Access Supports for Living, where I am now. I am a facilitator for our DEI training program. It's a mandatory training program, meaning every employee in the agency uh, needs to take DEI training. Um, we started this after George Floyd was killed. Um, I'm also a member of the uh, DEI uh, Leadership Mentor Program. So for access, uh, this is about uh, uh, a systematic business strategy to ensure that everyone shares the same advantages and uh, benefits. And this is very important because we are in the community. We're working with lots of different people in lots of different communities. So we need people who understand uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay. And I'll go next. I'll talk a little bit more about personal perspective and then business. Um, so I am part of the LGBTQ community, and that's probably what drew me to practicing, focusing on that community. Um, I have personally noticed a pretty big difference of when I'm dating a woman versus a man, how people treat me. Um, and it's given me a lot of insight into how that is for my clients. Um, I am also pretty well aware from previous agencies I've worked in and that a lot of LGBTQ clients do not get served as fairly or as well as some of their um, heterosexual or cisgendered peers. Um, I, one in five LGBTQ people report being mistreated by a healthcare uh, professional. And a lot of those people end up seeking out my practice. Um, so it's really been my mission to help kind of change that in um, the therapy industry to provide a practice that focuses on those issues um, and can be understanding. And you don't need to educate the therapist that you see on everything that you're going through um, or uh, risk being told things that are pretty psychologically damaging. So um, that's partly why I got most specifically with LGBTQ issues. Um, but I also realized that I needed to expand my understanding. Um, I've grown up in very white communities. So I really need to um, increase my understanding of people of color and their backgrounds in order to work with more diverse clients. So that's something that I've been diving into more recently. Um, and working in the legal cannabis industry, giving them DEI trainings, which are focused more on people with past drug offenses. Um, it's really trying to serve that population and give them legal job opportunities. So um, that's how I've gotten involved a bit more in DEI of the last few years. Yvette, you wanna go? Yeah, um, so professionally, as I mentioned, I've been involved for over 15 years. Um, I first started out, so I've been with, with the company for over 22 years, so I've kind of grown through acquisitions. Um, it started off as Reuters, and now we're the London Stock Exchange. But about 15 years ago, I started to get involved on a voluntary basis as part of a regional council, um, you know, where we would just do good and get out there in the community and make donations, and just because it felt good from a corporate responsibility perspective. Um, and then in 2018, I stepped up to the global co-chair role for the Latino Employee Network, um, which was really around the time where we started to establish um, clear goals and clear objectives. We hired somebody as like the head of diversity and inclusion and started things started to get more real um, and, and the business really started to look at it and um, take it seriously. Currently, I, uh, I serve as the pillar lead for talent acquisition and talent development within the Latino network. And through these roles that I've had over the past several years, I've helped develop and shape the progress of our DE&I strategy globally. Um, and I can tell you that it has come a very, very long way, 
most of the progress has been made probably within the last two years. Um, so um, I started to work closely with um, the other inclusion network leads. That's been very um, educational and eye-opening for me. So I, I am a member of the Latino network, but I also work closely with the women's network and the LGBTQ+, the Black, the Asian, the multi-faith, the veterans, the disability network that we have at our organization. And I've learned like so much, just like JJ mentioned, I've learned so much just by putting myself in those conversations um, and, and working alongside those amazing colleagues. I've also worked with um, corporate clients, right? Because as, as this initiative grew, it did grow for, for our clients and we partnered and collaborated on, on events and panels and discussions such as these. Um, I've worked with local, local organizations focused on developing and inspiring youth and future leaders. That's, that's something that I really love to do as well and um, sort of reach back. Uh, you'll hear this a lot in when people talk about DE&I is, you know, it's one thing to move forward, but it's also great if you could reach back and lift other people along with you on the journey. Wow. I say that through, through my years of working um, within DE&I, um, like I said, I, we really haven't seen that, um, that growth as much as we did after the murder of George Floyd, which you know, was really a significant event. And that tragedy really forced people to acknowledge that racism really does exist. And it completely changed the game for us, you know, the DEI champions, because people started to take this seriously. Um, on a personal note, you know, I'm raising with my husband multiracial children. And so, my husband, Jose, is Black and Puerto Rican. I'm Colombian, Belgian, and Italian. Um, so we have a big mixture in our family. And, um, you know, it's, it's sad, but it's really true that discrimination does exist, even within our own cultures. So when we talk about, um, you know, when maybe we're in the middle of a conversation with, with different generations within our own family, you know, there will be these small microaggressions or conversations about light skin versus dark skin or light eyes versus dark eyes or good hair versus bad hair, right? Um, and so these conversations are happening and, and the more, I guess I put myself in, in a position of learning and hearing different uh, li lived experiences and perspectives from others, um, I'm able to have a voice I'm able to um, have these conversations with, with my children, which is really important as, as we try to raise, raise our children to respect others and um, know that they can achieve whatever and, and hopefully they have the same opportunity as, as, of, as everybody else. So that's why for me, it's really important, not only in the workplace, but in, at home as well. Wow. I mean, Seriously, you are all amazing, amazing. Um, let's get into and find out why is DEI so important? Uh, Greg, do you wanna talk about that first? Sure, sure. So, so, so when I think about the importance of DEI, let me take it from the perspective of the workplace, right? So I wanna share some uh, information uh, uh, with you. It was a study conducted in 2017 by the Boston Consulting Group, and here's what they found. Inclusive teams make better business decisions up to 87% of the time, right? Uh, secondly, organizations with greater levels of inclusion and diversity outperform those with lower levels. And third, teams that follow an inclusive process make decisions two times faster with half the meeting. But I wanna share a story with you that, that, that dates back a while um, uh, about the lack of diversity and inclusion. Uh, it's a story about the Chevy Nova. Anyone remember that car? Oh yeah. Chevy Nova. Uh, it, was a, it was a very popular car 
in the 1970s, right? Um, and uh, I didn't have my driver's license at that, at that time. I'm not going to give away my age, but uh, uh, but at the time, Chevy or GM wanted to expand to the Latin American uh, market, uh, and, but they and they tried selling the Nova in Latin America, and it didn't do well at all. And they were shocked by it because it did, as I said, very well uh, here, here in here in the uh, United States. Can anyone guess why the Chevy Nova didn't do well in Latin America? Anyone? It's raising her hands. Who's, who's raising? I think it means something like lemon or a bomb or something like that in Spanish, right? Uh, won't go. Not not oh, quite. won't go. Won't go. Won't right, go. Right. Right. No. It's, it's the name. It's two, it's it's the two name. words. Name it's two bad. words, right? In Spanish, it's two words. Nova. It's two words. Means no go. So that just speaks to it's a it's it's a lesson about having diverse teams in the workplace, right? Um, I, I, I think if, if, if they had had a diverse team in the workplace at that time, I think someone would have caught that problem. So again, when we talk about the importance of DEI, you know, it's, 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 it's incredibly important that we have diverse voices in the workplace. Um, but it, it goes beyond diversity. It goes to making people feel that they're part of the team and that's, and that's inclusion. Fantastic. Yvette, did you wanna say something? Yeah, I will just piggyback off of what Greg said. I think, you know, first and foremost, I think we can all agree that it's very simply just the right thing to do to be inclusive and, and to consider others. Um, and then, you know, obviously it's good for business. Right? We need to be reflective of the communities in which we live. Um, it's essential for growth. And those are really simple reasons why it's important. But um, you know, when you provide an inclusive environment where people feel included, they feel valued, um, they feel that they have a voice and their opinion matters, you know, it's just overall better for performance, as Greg stated with, with those case studies. Um, you know, personally for me, when I started in my career, there weren't many people who looked like me in leadership. There were very few women and there were very few Latinos, men or women, um, that, that served as role models uh, for me in, in early on in my career. Um, so I'm really passionate about doing this type of work. Um, I'm really proud to be an advocate for behavioral change because that's what's needed um, so that people feel like they're represented, they have role models, and they, they have equal opportunity available to them. Great. I know that um, we're going to play a short video right now. Um, when I share that, um, is there just, do, do they need a piece of paper or a pencil for this? No, I would, I would, I would just say that, um, you know, please, it's a, it is, it is a very short video, just a little over two minutes, just um, give it your full attention. Okay. Um, and, and I, and just by way of introduction uh, to this video, there are things that can get in the way of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, that's all I'll say at this point. And uh, after after uh, Tina shows the video, we'll 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 talk about it some more. Screen. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let me make sure I get this. Let's start with a brain exercise. I'm going to ask you to visualize three scenarios. The visualization part is very important. So please close your eyes, take a deep breath, and imagine you're late to catch a flight. You rush through the airport, you make it through security, you run to the gate, you make it down the jetway, you step on the plane just as they close the door behind you, 
and the pilot steps out of the cockpit to say hi. You get to your destination, you go to a local restaurant, and you have the best meal of your life. I mean, really enjoy this. There's no calories in visualization. <laughs> and at the table next to you is a couple happily celebrating their anniversary. The next morning, you go to the biggest technology conference in the world, and the CEO of this year's hot, hottest tech startup just took the stage to speak. Now, you should have a solid picture of all of that. So open your eyes, because I have some questions for you. In your mental image, was the pilot black? Was the married couple two men? Did the tech CEO on stage look like me? It's OK if one or all of your answers is no. Your brain creates images of what's familiar. It's less of a fan of what's not familiar. The things I mentioned are generally less familiar. The black pilot, the same-sex married couple, the female tech CEO. No matter how much you might love the idea of those things, when immediately confronted with them, the amygdala, that's the most ancient part of your brain, signals the hypothalamus to fire up the hypothalamic pituitary axis, which is where the brain and the endocrine system intersect. So at this point, your adrenal glands release cortisol into your bloodstream, which triggers your stress response. I think this we is can the, the video, Tina. According to the Dartmouth Undergraduate Journal of Science. And it's Thank you. Okay, so tell me about, tell us about a time when you recognized your own unconscious bias. Who wants to go? I, I will just jump in here and I, I'll say that that, that two minute was, is very powerful. Um, and you know, you don't have to disclose what your images look like here, but it is absolutely um, something that's crucial for us if we're gonna be changing the way we behave. It's the first step is, is acknowledgement that, it, that this unconscious bias exists. Um, and it exists for all of us because we're human and that's just what we do. So um, a funny story I will share with you the, when I thought about this question is, um, you know, I, I have several. There, there are many times where, you know, I thought a certain way and it's just because of my experience. But when my youngest daughter was young, um, she, she spiked a fever and I had to get her over to urgent care. And um, I did that, we got her in the car, it was very late at night, um, but oddly enough, the urgent care was very busy. So we sat in the room, she was a bit nervous, and um, we had a gentleman come in who was Middle Eastern, and he asked us some questions and he said, bear with us, we're just really busy, I don't know what's going on tonight, um, but I'm gonna be right back. And then a black woman came in to the room and she asked us the same questions. And um, I answered the questions and she said, oh my gosh, we're really busy. Just give me a second and I'm, I'll be back in. And so when I, I turned to my daughter, I said, oh, you know, I guess the doctor's gonna come back, that nice man that was here. So don't worry, don't be, don't be nervous, don't be scared. And she said, mommy, the, the, the woman is the doctor. And I said, well, no, how, you know, why do you think that? And she said, because she's the one who was wearing the stethoscope around her neck. And it was actually true, right? So right away, my mind went to doctor is usually a man um, and you don't see very many black women that are doctors. And right there, I caught myself like, why, why did I think that way, right? Because of whatever that unconscious bias is. So that's, that's my story. And I guess I'll pass it to JJ. I, I think we all have a story to share. Yes, thank you, Yvette. Um, so I'll share a story about my first day working at the methadone clinic, which for those of you who don't know what methadone is, it's a uh, replacement opiate drugs for people who are um, trying to get off of or coming off of heroin, fentanyl, and other opiates. So when I started this job, I thought I was going to be working with a very diverse population. After all, it was in a very diverse city. I was very surprised from day one that my caseload was almost all white people. 
and almost everybody I saw at the clinic was white. And I really had to confront my own stereotypes I had about drug users being people of color. Um, it also made me look into some statistics of actually most of the people who use drugs are white, 80% of them. Um, and yet we tend to have these stereotypes from media. Um, and investigating that further, I realized that the methadone clinic was for a lot of people a second chance after they have been through some criminal justice system. And for a lot of people of color, they don't often get that second chance. They may not have had the opportunity to be on a methadone clinic. So it really made me confront the stereotypes for myself, which was particularly surprising to me because the whole reason I went into methadone treatment was after seeing a close family member of mine go through opiate addiction and my family is white. So I still went in with these stereotypes despite having that be very personal and prevalent to me that white people use drugs. Um, so I really had to change my perspective um, and try to figure out how can I cater more to the few people of color who often had a lot of mistrust of therapists at the clinic for understandable reasons. They often had a lot more legal involvement, a lot more DCF involvement. So um, it had to force me to change my approach as a therapist. So I wasn't just catering only to the majority white crowd there. I'll pass this on to Greg, who also has a story to share. Thanks, JJ. Um, so so there, 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 there are many stories that I could tell you about my own unconscious bias, right? But uh, the one that I want to share with you is really the one that made me see for the first time how unconscious bias works, right? And made me, makes me think all the time uh, that, I, that, I, that I need to uh, challenge myself when it comes to uh, unconscious bias. But when I was doing consulting work, I was asked to um, do a program, a six week program for the uh, Curious Joel community. That's the Hasidic community in Monroe. And when I, when I was asked to do it, the first thing I thought was, well, they you know, when they see who I am, they're not gonna want me there. They're not gonna want to work with me, right? Um, and as I started talking to people about the, the doing this work for, for them, so many people had a negative view of that, of that community, so many of them. And, and in fact, they, they, they were, many of them were encouraging me not to do the work, right? To just say no. They thought that, you know, they said that I wasn't gonna get paid because they stiff people and so forth. Um, meanwhile, the community wasn't paying me. There was, a, there was another organization paying me to teach this course. Um, nevertheless, I went on to do it. And the story is that, you know, I met some of the nicest people that you would ever encounter. It, 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 it just, because my, my, my experience with the community has been seeing people walking, walking in the street, seeing that they dress differently, hearing different things about them, but I'd never really, I've never even spoken to uh, a uh, Hasidic person. And so, so, uh, you know, from then on, I really have to, I really challenge myself when, when the first thing usually negative pops into my mind about uh, a group of people that are that are different than me. I really have to challenge myself and think about my experience with the with the uh, Hasidic community. The other thing I went in thinking was that the 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 women in the Hasidic community are sort of subservient to the men, right? So 
one thing was I was at the I was at the front of the room and there was a divider down the middle of the room that separated the 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 women from the men. The women walked into the room, kept their eyes straight, never spoke to the men. But once the class started, boy, did those women let the men have it. <laughs> we were talking about business plans and and these these were all business owners in the community. And many of the women, although their 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 husbands were were uh, the name on the business and uh, but but they didn't they didn't run the business. The, many of the many of the women ran ran the business and they were they were very outspoken uh so you know that was another lesson learned uh by working with uh, the the uh curious job uh community wow so this is for fairly a uh, similar uh question i think but professionally what are some misconceptions about individuals that you assist in your in your jobs who wants to take that so uh, um, let me let me let me jump right in on that so as i mentioned at the top i work with people with uh with uh, disabilities and um you know people with disabilities are less likely to be employed than than the non-disabled. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the stigma around disability, right? And, and by the way, this is just not, we're, I'm, I, we, we, we don't work with a lot of people who have physical disabilities. It's more developmental disabilities. Uh, it's more about mental health challenges like depression some of the un, uh, you, you know, the the hidden disabilities, if you will, because you can't tell uh, if someone has uh, depression or or has anxiety and so forth. But it's 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 sometimes a real struggle to to uh, help people get jobs in the community, and many many people, lots of them, the majority of them are perfectly capable of doing, uh, you know, a lot of different uh, types of work. Um, people, even people who have developmental disabilities, uh, you know, if someone is autistic, they're, they're sometimes very, very strong in certain areas. And it's just a matter of thinking differently about, about that population. Um, so, that's 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 a challenge that I face. One of one of the things that I ran into recently was uh, was a young man who uh, was working and doing very well at the company, and suddenly he he uh, you know quit. He wanted to quit, and uh, and when I when I spoke to uh, his uh, mother. She told me that he confided in his sister. He didn't even want to tell his mother that uh, one of the managers where he worked uh, became very frustrated with him and said to him, "What are you retarded?" And uh, you know that's that's a microaggression, first of all. Um, but but you know that those are again those are the things that when we talk about unconscious bias and we talk about microaggressions, those are the things that get in the way of inclusion. So um, I, I would encourage you all to think differently about hiring people with uh, disabilities. Thank you, Greg, that was, that's amazing. Um, JJ or Yvette, which one would you like to take this? I could take it. Um... The population I work with, there are so many misconceptions. I mean, we all know of stereotypes of gay people, of trans people, of bisexual people um, that tend to be pretty harmful. Um, but even within those communities, there's a lot of stereotypes. Um, like I have lesbian clients who refuse to date bisexual women because there's this fear that they're going to run off. Um, and 
it really limits their dating opportunities. And it's really harmful for a lot of my bisexual clients who continuously encounter that. Um, within the medical field, I get a lot of clients who tell me about being mistreated. Um, so particularly with anything having to do with sexual health, they might be afraid to speak up or say what they're actually doing or what symptoms they're actually experiencing. Um, and when they do, they often get confronted with misunderstanding um, with people assuming things about them that are incorrect um, and just with poor medical care. Um, there are times where I ask clients like, was this basic thing done? And it wasn't even done. Um, so there is a lot of inadequate resources for people and inadequate support for the LGBTQ community. Um, Given that, that's what tends to lead to the higher prevalence of mental health disorders and substance use disorders in that community. When people of the LGBTQ community do have adequate support and resources, they tend to have the same mental health and substance use rates as their cisgendered or heterosexual peers. So there is this common stereotype in that community and people outside that community of thinking, well, you know, so many people are crazy, but it's the world kind of making them that way. When you have lack of support, lack of resources, having a hard time finding jobs or housing, of course, there's going to be difficulties with mental health. There might be difficulties with substance use. And that is not innate to anyone's gender identity or sexual orientation. Um, so it's my job to try to help people build those resources so that they can have the best chances they can in life. Wow. That um, I would say more along the lines of, of not misconceptions, but barriers that I face um, a lot in my role. Um, one of the biggest for me over the years has been getting the data. And so companies have really um, not wanted to disclose the data on diversity and how they rank. Um, for me, I really feel that what gets measured gets achieved have a baseline to start with, how could we measure our improvement? How could we measure that we're actually making a difference, that we're actually moving the needle? Um, so we did implement a self-ID campaign um, two years ago, and that was completely voluntary. So through our um, HR system, people could go in and, and click off different pieces of data on you know, sexual orientation, marital status, ability or disability status. And um, you know, some of it was sensitive or uh, information. We had to, because we're a global organization, we had to be very careful about um, disclosing what uh, the data showed, but you know, it, it was a benchmark for us to start to see if we were making an impact. And I think that was a really, huge accomplishment or a breakthrough. Um, another challenge is, um, you'll hear this a lot, preaching to the choir. We would do so much work into putting on events and having conversations such as these. And really when you look around you in the audience, it's all people that really don't need to hear this, that they've heard it all before, that um, you know, we wanted to bring people into the conversation that could like maybe have power to make decisions and make those changes um, to make a difference. And um, that isn't always the case. People don't always feel comfortable to be a part of these conversations for whatever reason. They don't feel, um, they, they don't wanna be discovered as not knowing enough or um, you know for fear that they're gonna say the wrong thing. And um, we really wish we would bring other people in. Um, the other thing that I hear all the time is we can't find diverse, really good diverse talent. And so, you know, maybe back in the day, you would just settle for that answer, but no more. You're not looking in the right places if you think you can't find top talent that's diverse. Um, you kind of got to hold a mirror up and say, you know, what does my process look like? And how can I change some of those things that encourage unconscious bias, you know, be it um, maybe removing the name from a resume. So right away, if you read a resume name and it could, you, you know that this person is Asian or the name sounds black or Latino, you know, that is already creating this unconscious bias before you even take a look at this person. Um, 
And, you know, we, we have to take a, a really hard look at, at talent and how to keep them retain retention is, is a big deal. Like, like Greg mentioned before, because, you know, people want to go where they're celebrated, not tolerated. And, um, if we want things to change, we have to start looking at, at the processes in which we we do this. Great. So and I just want to make sure we're going to jump in for one second. And sure. just, uh, Yvette said something about finding finding talent. You know, one of one of the things that we found also is that there is affinity bias, right? So if we keep going to the same schools because this is where you know, a, a lot of people have already graduated from. We're not. We're not going to get that talent, right? We're, mm -hmm. we're, we're. It, it's it's not going to be open to others. Um, or if we're looking at people because they simply, um, you know, live in the same town or something to that effect, um, it 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 closes out a lot of other other talent that we could be getting. So. So that's something to uh, uh, consider as well. You know, so this is this is really awesome because it's really what I'm hearing is that we have to start looking at ourselves, at our uh, at uh, not outward as much as inward, and also what the processes that we employ to to do really anything in our lives. So this is very, and you know, this one, Yvette, you and I have had conversations on this, and I really appreciate that. I want to understand, I want everybody else to understand what is allyship and how can someone become an ally? Can you guys explain that? Because this is this is where we can all, this is the part of the panel discussion where now that you can give us some ideas as to how we can do this and what it is. JJ, you want to take a stab at that first? Um, yes, <laughs> there's so many ways to be a better ally. So. Um, and one thing I want to caution first is there's a lot of performative allyship. So, for example, in the month of June, there's suddenly rainbows on everything, everywhere you go, especially in the city. And then come July, all those rainbows go away. Um, there are forums in the LGBTQ community of what companies actually do support LGBTQ rights. And you know, actually hire diverse people, actually support organizations, um, and which ones are kind of just doing this for the money. So you see that with Black Lives Matter flag. You see that with all kinds of um, social media posts that are, you know, saying Black Lives Matter, but it's more of a photo op at a protest. Um, so it's really what you're doing and how you're challenging yourself that is going to make you a better ally. Um, so just by being here in panels like this, you're learning more, you're learning other perspectives. Um, but going beyond that, um, try to get to know people who are different than you in your community. Honestly, when you take a look at your friend group, is it mostly people that look like you? You might want to reach out a bit more to other people you might know. It doesn't mean that you have to suddenly become like best friends with them or scare them away. But it is something where if you're looking at the people you regularly interact with, the people you um, care most about in your life, if they all tend to be of a very similar group as you, you're probably not getting many other perspectives. You're not learning. You're not challenging yourself. So that is one way. And you have to put yourself in diverse spaces to do that. So if the communities that you're in all are people that look mostly like you, you might want to find a bit more diverse communities to interact with. Um, we talked about in hiring practices, looking for more diverse candidates. You might need to question your methods. You might need to do an honest inventory with that. Um, and really trying to learn more. I know in the uh, questions or suggestions for resources. I, we can certainly give more resources to learn and podcasts to listen to at the end. Um, but you also have to show through action of trying to be more inclusive to people who don't just look like you in your life. Yeah. I'll just um, piggyback off of what JJ said. Allyship is crucial, is so, so, so important. And, and often when we're having these types of conversations. People always ask, well, what can I do to help? Like, how do I get more involved? What can I do? 
being an ally is really important. Um, you know, it's people who support and promote the common interest. They want to get involved. They want to learn, and they also benefit from that participation. So, um, I think we all need to recognize that we all have power and privilege. Um, we may not think so, but we do have the power to influence and um, everyone can advocate for change, for diversity, for equity, for inclusion. And the more people that get involved, the, the faster we will get there. So it's really important to, um, to become an ally. And just even if you feel uncomfortable sometimes, just put yourself in that conversation and just be open to learning. Great. Yeah, so I would, I would, I would just okay. add one more, one more quick thing. Um, and, and that is, you know, there's this concept of calling in and calling out, right? When we, when we hear some, something, you can, you can talk privately to someone or, you know, if it's something is said in, uh, with others around, you might want to call them out, right? Um, and unfortunately, sometimes we have to do that in our own families, right? We hear a lot of things in our families and uh, or discussions and so forth, from, you know, during Thanksgiving and and and, and um, you know sometimes they they are very negative things and mm -hmm. uh, we need to we need to say something. We need to say and think about different. think about what we're saying in front of children, right? What yeah, who you know, when you think about that. So I just want to make sure I know. Um, Nicole Cutler has asked a question. I know she probably has to get back to her next patient. So in her medical field, um, she wants to update her health intake forms because they're not, they're currently, they're not currently non-binary friendly. Besides asking for preferred pronouns, any guidance on how to sensitively ask questions specific to gender like menstrual cycle, prostate health, et cetera. Anybody take this? I can certainly take that on. Um, and this is a challenge of a lot of electronic medical health record systems as they don't tend to um, have ability to make it very prominent to see someone's pronouns and preferred name. Oftentimes you have to use someone's what's called a dead name. Um, it's their name they were assigned at birth that they're no longer using um, on their medical records because that's what's accepted by insurance. Um, if there is any way to change that, I really recommend it. In terms of asking questions sensitively, um, really using terms that are gender neutral. So like I use the term like genitals, menstruation, um, like chest feeding for breastfeeding um, for people who are non-binary or trans, um, using terms that are um, also refer to partners or sex acts if you're in like uh, sexual health that are gender um, neutral as well. So like spouse instead of wife or husband. Um, once when someone says a term, go ahead and use that term for them. Um, so if they are a, um, a gay woman and they're referring to their spouse as their wife, using the term wife is gonna be more respectful than keep saying spouse. Um, so really just respecting what people tell you. For a lot of healthcare practitioners, this can be challenging because you have so many patients and it's easy to lose these details. Um, so I do encourage making notes of this kind of prominent on their medical record if possible. Um, I just yesterday was meeting with a client who's participating in a transgender study and they were misgendered during the study. So even professionals who know and are studying this still make mistakes. Um, and I was explaining to him, I don't think that's probably featured on your medical records. Um, so it is something that, you know, I encourage you to kind of look at the system you have and influence change, not just for you, but for other staff you're working with. So you're all on the same page and are using the same system. Does that help, Nicole? Okay, good. All right, um, so we had another question. Uh, Crystal's asking, what advice would you give or share with hiring managers, supervisors that are persons of, that are person of color themselves and part of the hiring process, who might express, the, should they express their own struggle with their own unconscious bias during the interviews? This may show up as wanting to hire people who look like them. So I guess it's that, did I, did I say that right? So you can unmute, okay. 
Go ahead. Yes, thanks. It's essentially, that that's it. So for example, a Black woman who's un, in conducting interviews on, as part of a team, she finds herself wanting to, you know, looking at the candidates that come in, oh, she's a Black woman, we need more Black women, I'm, I want to hire her, as opposed to looking at, mm -hmm. and she finds herself consistently trying, you know, thinking that way. Yeah, I, I could probably take a stab at this one. So I've had um, a lot of experience dealing with teams and hiring. And I think where you can remove some of that bias is where the where you get more people involved, right? So A, you want a diverse candidate pool, but B, you want a diverse uh, interview slate as well, right? And maybe it's diverse in that it's different people that look different, but also from the background. So you get a, a product manager in or a technology person so that they're looking at different things specifically and they're grading that person or measuring that person against you know very consistent guidelines, let's say. And so the more people you get involved, sometimes you, you can't always do that, right? It, it's a, it needs to be a fast hire or um, you know there are other things that come into play, but, but that would be my suggestion. And Tina, I'm just conscious that we're we're at time. Yes. Yep. I'm um, sure so we have a lot more questions there. Right. I know. I know. Um, with the as far as the uh, you know podcasts and other resources, we can put some of those into the description of the YouTube. Um, when we have it on YouTube, we can actually include that. I just want to mention something. Mary Ellen is saying that she's working towards becoming an IPEC coach for people in her wheelchair community. And she'd like to hear more discussions in the future on the, their disparities. So I think that's something that we also ties in with what are we going, what are we doing next with this? Well, we're gonna work on that. Um, we're gonna work on what's next. We're, there will be a next, whether this is serious. However, we're going to all meet and talk and we'd love to have, love, love, love to have your comments. Uh, just like that, Mary Ellen, on what you wanna see, what you wanna know about. But I just, I right now, I just want to take the time to say thank you. And I really have to say the biggest thank you to Coach Glow Favreau, who was brought this to the regional um, uh, 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 director. Uh, and they, she said, we need this. You know, she's hearing this and she brought it and she, and she said, let's go and really, really um, uh, went full force with this. So thank you, Coach. Can't thank you enough. And also to our three panelists who have believe what they, they have been meeting on this. They have been talking about it. They've started the conversation. They started the momentum. I just want to thank you so much, Yvette Sanchez, JJ and Greg uh, Knowles. Thank you so much for, for uh, being here and doing this with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure.